please, before I hand over to Anna, who is chairing this session. Um, no, that was useless. Where are, where are the other two? It's here. Oh, they're here. Right, right. <laughs> um, are there any announcements? Anybody doing any practical things that they want to ask? Or no? Or all okay? Fine. I just want to remind you that at lunchtime in here, we'll be showing uh, the film about the struggle against Coca-Cola in Guatemala. Uh, so that will be lunchtime in here, so you can get your sandwiches on the end down the corridor there and bring it in and uh, watch the film. And Dan will be here to introduce uh, the film beforehand. Um, yeah, okay, and this session is all about, this whole day, is all about the politics of organizing, what we're calling building the trade union movement from below. And our first session is entitled The Fall and Rise of Labor, question um, mark. Uh, looking at trends, different trends in the international trade union movement. So we've got three wonderful speakers and hopefully a very good discussion. So I'll hand over to Anna. Thank you very much, Dave. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Anna Bocheva. I'm from BWI. I'm the BWI campaign officer. And I'm very pleased to chair this session, this morning session. So I think that we have a very interesting question to discuss. And uh, the goal of this uh, session, as we discussed uh, before with the uh, panelists and Dave, is to construct, compose uh, the global picture of what is happening in the labor field. What changes and opportunities working people face around the world. And we will do it with the help of uh, three wonderful presenters. Sinjit Panjita from Asia Monitor Resource Center in Hong Kong. Ilya Bukyakov, who is sitting here because he wants to see the presentation of the first presenter from the uh, IEF, uh, Global Trade Union Federation of Food Workers. And uh, Rosa Paranelli, uh, General Secretary of Public Services International. And uh, uh, we will do it uh, the same way we did uh, yesterday. Uh, first, we will hear a uh, presentation, then we will have uh, some. A uh, small time to discuss it here in the plenary, and then we will break down into four groups and uh, discuss this question and as well uh, the questions that our presenters will raise, and uh, then come back uh, here and uh, have plenary session once again. So I would like to give floor to the first uh, presenter, Sanjit Panjita, Asia Monitor Resource Center, Hong Kong. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm the lucky one because you just came for, to hear my presentation first, so I'll get all the attention, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'll, I'll talk about what is generally happening in Asia in terms of labor organizing in different sectors and what issues and problems we're facing. And I'm just using uh, pictures. Uh, there's no text. Uh, I wanted, actually, one friend told me, you use seven pictures to tell the whole story. But I can't just use seven. I have more than seven pictures. So uh, this is Asia. I mean, uh, I just want to tell you what is that we mean by Asia, because we don't cover Middle East. I mean, in my presentation, the Asia will start Pakistan uh, eastwards. So most of what I would be speaking would be about South Asia, Southeast Asia, and a bit about East Asia. Oops, sorry. So we have heard a lot in past few years about rising Asia. And uh, you know, many global financial institutions like the IMF, World Bank, even Credit Asia with taking out world out of its worst global crisis. So it seems Asia is rich and is doing a great favor to the global corporations by bringing them out of this uh, crisis. And also you can see Asia's share in global output has increased consistently. Uh, Asia is often referred to as global factory and we know China's position in terms of manufacturing hub of whole world 
there has been a considerable increase in manufacturing in Asia. Now then, uh, what is happening at ground? Yesterday we heard something about uh, what Harvey says, disposition. I think it's very important. This has happened, this, these cycles of disposition has happened with all of us at different times in history. So I'm just going to take you through a bit of a time travel. This happened yesterday. This picture, I don't know if you can see because there's a lot of light here. This is a rural Cambodia and my colleague uh, Palin, she's going to talk later from Cambodia, just got this picture. There's a crackdown. You can see these armed police in a very beautiful, pristine part of Cambodia. This is what is happening in Asia right now. Many countries, East Asia, South Asia, there is a war happening. People are being dispossessed of their land. People are being thrown out of their land and there is a forcible eviction. This is in collaboration nexus with police, I mean, of course, companies. The land is required for plantation, for, uh, for uh, mining, for any other thing or just simple real estate development. So people are being pushed out constantly uh, out of their land. Uh, I mean, I have a quote, uh, Vedanta is one of the big mining companies. They often say, oh, we want this land because we want to provide drinking water and education to the, to the uh, villages in the Indian communities. So what is happening as a result? But this is not the only way people are dispossessed or people are moving out of land for many other reasons. But then they take, they just go to the nearest place where conveniently due to what we talked about, the neoliberal <coughs> policies which many Asian countries have employed, they put an export processing zone or a factory area enticing these workers because now they have been forced out of their lands because there are many other reasons. Now they need money to buy things. Everything is a commodity. So there are many things they have to go and move to the city. So this is this migration at present from rural to urban areas is unprecedented at any time in the history of the industrial world. It's like in if we take just China and my colleague will talk about, I mean, a friend from CLB is going to talk more about China. But this is like 300, more than 300 million people, like the population, entire population of United States is on move. And where do they end up? I just want to present two factories because I am sure all of us have been touched by these two factories. These are in China. This is Yu Yuan. You must have heard there was a strike recently in this factory. It is massive. It manufactures shoes for all these brands. It's like more than 80,000 workers putting together shoes for all major brands. And the second one is the Foxconn. Our iPads, our iPhones, all assembled there. Huge factories. So this is where some of them end up. Or this is garment workers in Cambodia or Bangladesh. Dispossessed from land, they end up there. Yet, majority of workers don't end up in these formal workplaces. They end up in informal units or in, they work as these are women collecting shells or they work in, in a, uh, street vendors or something like that in the big vast informal economy. This is the picture I, uh, I just took from the internet and the funny thing was it was posted a construction worker in India is predominantly more like an informal sector unlike many other countries. But she's carrying her child uh, you can see and in, in India it was going on Facebook where they were saying Ma Tujay Salam, we salute you, salute you mother for doing such a great work. I mean nobody thinks why people have to work like that. They are, uh, they are congratulating this mother for being able to take her child to this kind of work. And of course there are many forms of informal work people do. But what is important for us to know is uh, Asia has one of the largest population of workers working in the precarious employment or also in the vulnerable sector. 
And I mean, I don't want to go into uh, statistics, but uh, I mean, the figures, there are different figures, but one of the figures is that the population of such workers is more than 1 billion. So a, out of a 4 billion worker or 4 billion population in Asia, there is almost 1 billion people, which is about 70% of the total vulnerable employment in the world. <clears throat> in similar way, there are more working poor in absolute numbers in South Asia than Sub-Saharan Africa. So this whole concept of Asia shining is a myth and we all know this is a very small group of elites within our countries making windfall money in collaboration with the global capital. That's, this is the time we have to end this capitalism and I'll come into detail on that. But what is also interesting to know, in past 20 years, the inequity in Asia has increased more than any other place in the world. I mean, it hasn't reached to the levels of what we see in Latin American countries, but the rate of increase has been more than anywhere else, and it is China at present is one of the most unequal countries in Asia. The wealth distribution is huge. And it has to do with because the way the work is being organized, there is very limited, limited uh, opportunity for workers to come together to organize, so there is to build bargaining power. So the capital is accumulate. It is a very nice condition for capital because what we heard yesterday, disposition by, well, uh, sorry, accumulation by disposition, and disposition is not only they're not only dispossessed from their land and resources, but they're also dispossessed from their rights, what we see also here happening in Europe. So disposition of rights, some people, some workers had some rights, so they are being dispossessed from that. So the, my question is, we saw, uh, well, we saw some workers, uh, who uh, so some people who had to move out of the rural areas. So much of the organizing starts at the, production level and we are now thinking or the new ways of organizing how to look at this whole cycle and think I mean yesterday we were having this discussion about what is the way ahead we think and when we I mean what is the kind of society we want and then what is the kind of work people will do because then we can challenge this economic system because then we have to see the whole cycle and organize people at all cycle because they are all same people. It's the same farmer goes to work in a factory, the same farmer will work part time as a construction worker. So all of us are working people now. So that dichotomy between formal and informal workers is fast shrinking. Yes, thank you. I'll just move. This is the working condition. You know, this is a picture we took in Cambodia this December. There was a big strike in Cambodia. Uh, uh, there is, uh, this is how they'll end up living. I mean, this is not development. You bring, you take out people out of their pristine environment and they are working here. And this is not only Philippines, this is, hap uh, sorry, this is not only in Phili Cambodia, this is happening in Philippines and many other parts in Asia. Uh, one of the other things, the price which has to be paid, more than one million workers die every year in Asia, which is unprecedented. And this is a very conservative estimate because we don't know actual number because nobody keeps the numbers. Uh, just quickly go through. 20 years back, there was a major fire in Thailand which killed 188. So there was a lot of campaign to improve the situation in the supply chain. But 20 years down the lane, it seems not much has. We haven't been able to do much because last, uh, 2012, there was a, one major fire in Karachi then Bangladesh, then Rana Plaza. So the thing is, we cannot reform the supply chain. That discussion should end now. Supply, the way that we are making things is we cannot make small changes in supply chain and expect workers will have good wages or something like that. That's, that's not going to happen. They are going to move to other countries. They are going to move around. So once for all, we have to say there has to be some structural change Things cannot be made in the way they have been doing it in past 20, 30 years. 
it is killing workers, it is alienating communities. So what is the new way? So last year there have been also some of the largest strikes we have seen in Asia in in with the trade unions. This there was a strike in India which had hundred million workers, a general strike, but doesn't get much coverage when you won't see it in mainstream media. There was a large strike in Hong Kong. Uh, there was a dock worker strike. Indonesia, just see the Bangladesh. Of all the attention that came from the world after the Rana Plaza fire, the only change was possible when workers took on the street. And there was more than 50% wage hike in Bangladesh. My, we have colleagues from Bangladesh. They can tell, speak in detail about it. This was Cambodia. Uh, there was a major general strike in Cambodia last year, December. Which, and there was a very violent crackdown on that. This was Korea. Also informal workers. I mean, these are some of the pictures from Pakistan. And Khalid will tell in detail. This is Palum workers, informal workers. Major strike. Uh, these are brick clean workers. You know, they are very small family who come to work at the brick clins. They went for strike. So people are organizing and different ways, new forms of organizing are coming up. Because I have to close, I'll just raise some few points. What, what is happening is, I think first of all, we have to believe all working people are one, no matter if they work in a steel plant, nuclear plant, whatever, whatever job they are doing, or a brick clean worker or a home based workers, they are all one. So uh, the question is, how are we going to bring, the, bring all of them together? We talked about different ways of organizing. It is happening. And the key to change is how are we going to organize these workers who work in informal settings or who are precarious workers within the formal <laughs> sector? How are they being organized? The challenge remains how and where are they going to bargain? You know, they are looking at different power structures because there's no employer anymore. But what are the powers in the society which they have to capture? So that is, the, that is how the political power, the bargaining has to be political bargaining and how within the society they can do it. The challenge still remains, <coughs> we are not able to build effective cross-sectoral linkages. Like there will be organizing uh, of home-based workers, there will be organizing of sex workers, there will be organizing of street vendors, but they still organize within their membership there is still difficulties to build a cross-sectoral alliance. That remains a challenge and uh, how we can overcome that. Lastly, there is a challenge in terms of leadership. With all this informal organizing, I think we will go through this. Uh, Dave will take that session on organizing. One of the challenges we are facing, you know, with these marginalized workers, when they are organized, it's they are organized by some external organizers then those who mostly come from middle class and then they take up the leadership. So you can see many of the informal worker organizations have leadership from the middle class. And it is a major challenge because we need, the change will only come, you know, we were talking yesterday in the smaller groups, the agency of change have to be the workers themselves, the marginalized workers themselves. We cannot bring change from outside. We just have to be catalysts for the change. But the issues, there are strong issues. If the leadership is coming from the outside, how is it going to change the situation? So how are we going to overcome that? Maybe it can be a temporary phase till the second line of leadership comes from the workers themselves. I think that is uh, that is another thing. Lastly, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I've taken a few more uh, minutes. Lastly, there needs to be genuine solidarity. I mean, between North and South, the solidarity cannot be based on pity. You know, nobody wants solidarity with Bangladesh people because they feel bad about Bangladesh people. You should have solidarity with Bangladesh workers if you think they will also strike. If there is a worker strike here, Bangladesh workers will also strike in Bangladesh for us here. So this is the spirit of solidarity we should have, which is based on equitable partnership. And that is something problematic with the present trade union movement. And I hope Khalid uh, Repon will talk more about it. The problem is there as bargaining is happening 
with these big trade union movements without consultation at the national level. So like when these fires happened in uh, Bangladesh or there is a dispute, labor dispute in Cambodia, ITUCs or global unions will go and sometimes make deals with the company uh, for the Cambodian workers without proper consultation at the national level. So how are we going to change and how is that transparency and equitable democracy because this, without their participation this there is not going to make, be any change and we have major issues with the accord and alliance in Bangladesh we will talk in detail because millions of dollars of money have been poured ILO has new officers many organizations have a hired staff but unfortunately not even one worker has been compensated till now even though there has millions of dollars have poured in. So I think uh, I have raised a lot of questions. Thank you very much. I stop here. So that was the perspective of Asia, from Asia, and uh, this perspective raised a lot of issues that I think we all will discuss. What uh, I think is uh, also very important that when we name all issues such as informal employment, precarious employment, uh, poor working conditions, poor labor conditions, the words it, uh, it looks better than the pictures. When we see what does it mean precarious employment, when we see with all these images what does it mean migration from rural, rural areas uh, to urban areas, that means it makes difference. So thank you very much for everything that you said and for the perspective that you brought uh, about what unions uh, should do with all these challenges. I think we will uh, now go forward and I will talk to Helio Buketa from uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Anna. Um, we were discussing last night what is actually this session uh, supposed to be about, and um, we came very late at the conclusion that it can be about anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Dave told me. He said, I just want to know your uh, vision on, on the topic, and that's it. So I'm going to share with you my vision on the topic of the politics of organizing, and if this is irrelevant for you, then blame Dave for this, please. <laughs> uh, well, to start with this, the politics of organizing, I believe uh, the, question, the main question for us is, what are we organizing for? We all uh, involved in different forms of activity, which are mobilizing people for action, which are uh, helping us to build organizations and the workplace in the regions and in our nations, but, uh, mm -hmm. but after all, the, the real question is why do we do this and what do we want to achieve? I believe that we do it because we are, not, we are really dissatisfied with the way this world is run. The system, economic and political system, is still the system of repression in all countries of the world, even in the most democratic countries of mm -hmm. the world, we see that the ability of the, of the workers to uh, challenge and to change their lives is, is shrinking everywhere. And uh, talking about organizing and its politics, we need to uh, place this question uh, in, in I have to probably share experience from the region where I come from. And I was born in Moscow. And uh, it's, it's a coincidence, but actually this was 25 years ago when I really got engaged in the labor movement. This was a year when it was still in the Soviet Union and USSR, uh, which was under perestroika. There were a lot of democratic movement, human rights organizations appearing. But what when mine workers went on strike and they said, now they end. And then it became clear that this system will be challenged and will change. And this impulse came from the working class movement. Um, my experience with this started as I was at that point a student uh, when we created solidarity committees to help mine workers to, to organize their action successfully. And in the very primitive uh, words, I will describe to you what was happening at that point. 
the workers went on strike. They went out of the mines and they, they occupied the area in front of the, of the mine, uh, in the mines and centers of the mine cities. And they were sitting there, waiting for the government officials. The government officials were coming. And this was all state-controlled economy. There were no real companies. But the government officials were coming and saying, what's going on? Uh, why you are not on your jobs? And they say, we fed up. We fed up with everything. And the government officials will say, OK, um, but what exactly you fed up? What, what do you want? Uh, yeah, we actually we haven't thought about this. <laughs> and the government officials said, okay, well, can you go back to work, think about what you want, and send it to us. And then we will see what we can do. So the workers in most cases were puzzled. They went back to the work. And at some point they realized nothing is changing, so they, they were more, more clever that one. They said, okay, we fed up again. We don't <laughs> strike again, but we will think about our demands. <laughs> Then they were preparing the demands. They went out on, on the streets. The government officials will arrive and say, what's going on? Well, we fed up. We want this uh, to change. And this is what we want. Here's a list of our demands. He will look at this and will say, well, this is quite fair. Now go back to work, and we will tell you what we will do. <laughs> so people thought, well, he's probably genuine and uh, is not telling us you know, uh, false, false promises. So we. we in most cases, people went back to work, and nothing changed. It took some time and a number, a circle of actions for people, for workers to realize that if you really want to have a change in your life, you need an organization. You need an organization which can help you to develop these demands, which can help you to develop a strategy, and which can make sure that actually your demands are met, and not a bloody government officials is disappearing with your list of uh, demands and not treating it as a piece of waste. So this was a, a, a very important uh, move for for the workers in in the, in the former USSR and uh, it challenged my life because at that point there was no expertise on how do you build an organization, what does it mean to have an organization, how the organization should be structured, and you know, have how the leadership is coming, how it's trained, what are the informational. Uh, instruments and what are the educational tools you need to keep this organization running. And that's how I got involved and, and I was taking part in a number of actions and events and organizing organizational building in, in uh, uh, well, in, in my part of the world, but also internationally working now for the IEF, which is the International, uh, international Organization for the <laughs> Workers. Um, Later, I learned from my international work already that actually organization is not the only thing you need. If you want to win, if you want to achieve results, you need something else. You don't only need an organization, but you need an organization strategy, and you need an organization which is capable to mobilize people and commit itself to fight till the end. These were the words of, the, uh, of one of my teachers, who is currently retired, the former uh, regional secretary of IUF Asia Pacific Organization, Ma Weipin. At some point, he said, um, he said, the nature of every industrial dispute, that's a conflict of interest. But the outcome, always determined by three factors. That is organization, the strategy, and commitment to win. Not just commitment to fight but a commitment to, to win, which means to fight till the very, very end. And uh, from my personal experience, I've observed in many cases that this is true. These three elements are very critical for what we do. And um, I want to just share with you a few recent examples referring to um, the debates which are much wider on the <laughs> nature of, of, of the civil society movement and on the nature of the protests which, are, which we observed in this century. Look at the Occupy movement. Huge movement involved thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, in many cases very proudly saying, we demand everything, nothing concrete. 
and um, we want to change, but we don't know what. Um, at some point, there were a number of people who were trying to analyze how is that you know, all appearing. But I remember there was some very, in the, in the, in the period of Aetheria, there were, there were a few articles appearing to say, actually, you can change the world without traditional tools. What Occupy movement is telling us, you don't need an organization if you want to achieve social change. And I think now it's quite obvious for everyone, this is a bullshit. Achieved nothing. It was not able to build anything uh, sustainable. It was not able to, uh, to, to, to change the system, to challenge the system. And it's now disappearing, spreading around. A few more concrete question, uh, uh, cases, and uh, one of them is a case which I'm gonna, I'm committed to talk about every time I'm, I'm, I'm speaking out, if I'm allowed to speak out. The Jean Ozen case in Kazakhstan. The, the yeah, the Jean Ozen case in Kazakhstan. I'm talking about this because they want us to forget about this, and this is why I'm committed to remind people about what happened every time. Um, Three years ago, 20,000 workers, oil workers in Kazakhstan, they went on strike to demand better pay. They were on strike for six months. They were faced with intimidation, oppression, uh, lots of tricks were played against them. And they were quite committed. They were very, very, it was a very strong movement. She was committed, but it ended up badly. This strike was shot by the armed, armed police and achieved nothing. We observed for these uh, six months the situation and we had a, a big group of very committed people with no organization. Every time they will have uh, a communication, however, they will nominate new group of people. Grassroots democracy. There should be always new people negotiating. At the end, it didn't work. <coughs> And with a huge commitment, uh, this, this action failed because there was no strategy and there was no organization. Um, look at what, what, what was happening and what is happening now in Ukraine. The popular movement of Maidan, which was a movement built against corruption for the change in the system. It was a genuine, popular, democratic movement which involved thousands and thousands of people. And uh, it achieved what it wanted to achieve. Yanukovych, the corrupt president of this country, resigned and escaped. And look at what's happening now. The right-wing forces are using this situation to take the power and take the lead in the country. The democratic spirit of Maidan is now on the risk. It's getting lost because the Maidan movement didn't manage to create a structure, an organization with a vision and strategy of what is going to happen after Yanukovych resigns. And the right-wing forces, they were actually much more clever and much better prepared, and they do have the strategy. Um, so these are the three cases we can look at this from the point of view of the three elements and factors. Now, I think that we are living in a very interesting time when with new technologies we can do things. I'm working in IVF and I'm helping to set up different campaigns. What I can observe from, for example, the, the social media work. This is a unique source of information about different social uh, elements and tendencies in, in, in the When we have Indonesia or in Pakistan or in Egypt and we place information on Facebook, the number of people who support and interested to get the streamline of this information is growing every time. Most people come from this country where the conflict is going on. When we have a conflict in Egypt, our Facebook group will raise by 5,000 likes from Egypt. Then we go to Indonesia. What is interesting is growing in Indonesia, but the people who will link to us from Egypt, they are following what's going on in Indonesia and vice versa. This is a way to build and construct the links in, on the international level from the people from different countries these people who are on Facebook address, but they are in social media and they are they like to, to, to connect to each other. So we see this trend appearing 
the international cross-border movement, and I think we can utilize it. But again, the and the important is how the organization because commitment and organization strategy on the national level. The question is how do we build the international organization, the international organization which has this vision and which has uh, ability to mobilize and uh, commit people to fight till they win. And if I will be allowed two minutes more, I will tell you about uh, my current major focus of my work in IVF is on an interesting sector which is quite traditional or supposed to be traditional fish and seafood map but we never placed enough focus on what's going on there it's a huge industry employs millions of people lots of even more million people What's going on? Just to add to the picture on Asia, you probably know about the Guardian recent report about shrimps industry in Thailand, which yeah. is, which gives which provides the jobs. Well, slaves. These are not jobs. Thousand slaves employ, uh, working in this industry, and it's it's no escape place. Workers which are driven into the sent to the sea. You cannot escape from this boat. There is a mass uh, mass suicide. The only way for people to escape from this slavery is to kill themselves. They, they, they can, they, what Guardian um, journalists investigated and reported to, the cases when if somebody disobey on the boat, the employers or the, bo the bosses of the boat, they will uh, take the body of the, of the, of the person, of the worker, uh, string And they do it in front of all other workers. So all other workers are afraid to take any action. This is horrible what's going on in this world in the, in the 21st century. And this is something which we are going to work on. And what is uh, and refer, referring to the uh, sentence on the, on the solidarity, what can solidarity do? Of course, it's difficult to help and support people who are not to do anything for themselves. But we have now a very, very committed group of people challenging the whole huge tuna production industry. Seven engine sun the tuna production and fighting for reinstatement of uh, uh, and, and regaining of their jobs and a factory at the company called Citra Mina. These companies are not well known because it's a sector no one ever paid. We are working now with Joshua, who is here, to um, to help these workers to achieve a win. But this is really, really challenging. Imagine 78 people in the Philippines, in Jan Santos, decided they will fight against the huge global tuna industry just because they believe they deserve decent work and dignity. Uh, so there are we there, there is a lot of potential in the current world. And this show is coming from the uh, workplaces where people take the initiative. What we need to do, we need to link these local fights uh, on the international level into an international fight. And we have to remember this all had to fit into the organization, which will ensure that we also, we, that we not only fight endless, but we also win. We achieve the wins locally, nationally, and internationally. We have to challenge this. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this panel. And uh, well, 
as Kirill said, we were almost free to speak about uh, whatever we <laughs> wanted to do on this issue. And uh, I'm a bit afraid that we'll be out of tune uh, as regard to the two previous uh, uh, to the pr two previous uh, presentation, but uh, presentation. But uh, um, I mean, I will bring my experience as general secretary of an organization that is Public Services International and that uh, is organizing for the most part uh, uh, our formal workers in the world uh, because uh, we organize uh, workers in all public services, but not all, also in private services. And what is interesting for me um, to try to is uh, that uh, I have no answer if we are in, in a phase of rising or falling of the labor movement, uh, but for sure of uh, uh, that has never been and for sure at the eve of big change, because such an attack requires to uh, produce some change. Uh, I know that yesterday you had uh, a, a presentation on the global picture of the international situation, so I just would like uh, to start saying that uh, uh, the the financial and economic crisis has been used to produce the, uh, in that's not something new or started simply in 2008. It started long ago. It's uh, at least 20 years uh, that uh, this trend is ongoing uh, with small steps, with some uh, stops and then restart and so. But the crisis offered a very, very favorable background uh, to capitals and multinationals to build their theory that there's need uh, to reduce uh, public expenditure uh, spending in order to support a production without thinking that all this issue was uh, uh, transferred in terms of policies uh, that were focusing mainly on reducing public spending in essential public services that are one of the bases of the redistribution of the wealth and reduction of uh, injustice and inequality. More unemployment also in public services, but above all, these policies were unable to veil uh, the the fact that, that uh, there's an ideological background. Otherwise, it would be impossible to explain why, whenever you're facing such a discussion of the impact of the crisis, one of the element of the factor of in each country, no matter one of the fundamental uh, factor of this recipe to outcome to overcome the crisis are labor market reform active bargaining and uh, uh, and uh, trade union to collective bargaining or uh, um, to take uh, to take uh, action in this sense uh, i think that uh, longer uh, of uh, privatized public services is crucial to reduce general the right to work for public service workers. I just want to mention one example that for us, I mean, we are facing a lot of attack on public service workers, reduction of uh, even the right to organize in many, many sectors uh, that, um, but uh, just uh, to let you understand uh, how many examples people uh, who live in Europe are aware of what happened in the last 
in so many countries, but if you look around the world, just have an idea to the few and most recent uh, uh, situation. I don't want to speak about uh, what our colleague has already mentioned uh, that happened in Asia. I don't want to speak about what's happening in uh, Guatemala or still happening uh, despite some improvement in Colombia or in Ecuador or in all these places. But happening in South Korea is, uh, uh, under a certain point of view, emblematic because the government has decided one of the broadest and most violent process of privatization of public services. And this uh, attack on public services is all accompanied by or not recognition of trade union in each sector they are going to uh, to target with their program of privatization and you can wonder why why you want to privatize I mean I'm against but that can be a policy why to reduce the right of worker even when they are already recognized so it's clear the ideological background of such an attack uh, on uh, workers and uh, and services uh, the other uh, most recent example is just of last week when uh, the supreme court in the united states uh, um, released a a rule in which uh, they state uh, that uh, uh, there's no right uh, or no obligation uh, for the workers, uh, uh, for the, the union are not allowed to, to the home care workers to ask a fee for the collective bargaining uh, uh, to support the, the cost for the collective bargaining that normally apply to all workers, no matter if they are or not members of the unions. That has nothing to do with the power of negotiating, uh, or that's just to, it has just to do with the, the possibility to recognize to all worker better conditions, better salary. Moreover, to these workers that are in very weak condition because they normally work alone within families with no other linkage or contact. Uh, uh, as you can build in a normal working place and of course it has also another uh, aspect and another effect that is the quality of the services that you can provide if you're not organized. So I think that all these examples, big and uh, uh, tragic or less tragic, are all concentrated to reduce the power uh, of workers. You mentioned in conclusion of your presentation that uh, there is a, a tool in the hand of workers and this tool is strike but unfortunately the right to strike is under attack and is heavily under attack by all the multinational by many government by the representative of uh, employers we recently concluded uh, last month uh, three weeks ago the ILO conference uh, in this year where for the first time after many, many, many years, we couldn't reach a great conclusion on all the cases that were involving the right strike because of the complete opposition of, uh, of the employers to recognize that the right of strike is protected under Convention 87 of the ILO. Sometimes it's boring speaking about these things. Uh, sometimes you wonder why I have to bother in such meeting where we spend a lot of time just to achieve. But this is the only legal basis that we have and that we as unionists and workers can claim to be respected in front of the international uh, international uh, um, uh, Yep. international justice. Uh, so I think that this is, uh, I mean, one of the most evident attack to reduce the power of workers and their own right to organize. Uh, there will be a discussion that will start in November in the governing body of the ILO because now the only resource 
hands is to appeal need according to the rule of the IL 50% Court of the request of union to appeal the International Court of Justice. And without this, the challenge is huge for us. The challenge and the threat is really huge for us. Uh, I wanted to stick on this issue just to focus on other two, maybe three, uh, three uh, issues. I don't know how many minutes I have. Well, maybe I will just a bit, uh, bit more, I will go a bit more mm, longer, two, three minutes, no more than that. I think that we have potential that can raise enthusiasm, uh, but I think that we need to organize and we need to organize mobilizing also with our affiliates. I come from an experience where we do not negotiate uh, without the mandate and the participation of our members in the in the delegation. And I think this is what we have to do also at global level. It's more difficult, I understand. But you need to get the affiliates involved whenever you develop a campaign or whenever you're dealing with some sensitive issue, even within the international organization. So I said sometimes it's boring, but for the first time, we were able, as Global Union, uh, to have the recognition of the role of the trade union within uh, the UN uh, uh, Commission on the Status of Women just last year. And uh, uh, for the first time, UN Women, uh, which is uh, an in, 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 yes, uh, a body within uh, the UN that has recently uh, been uh, created. Uh, recognize the role of trade union as fundamental to address the issue of women. That's the first time. Migration. Migration is becoming one of the uh, vehicles for a new or kind of new forms of slavery. We were excluded from the uh, UN, uh, um, the, the Global uh, Forum on Development and Migration, um, trade unions and workers were not allowed to participate. But this year, for the first time, after years of insisting, 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 we were allowed to be there. And, you know, just propose your point of view, but at least opening a confrontation and discussion. And in my view, the most important uh, example of such persistency in uh, tackling our issue also within the international uh, institution is uh, uh, the, re the, the victory that we had within the UN on uh, uh, the campaign water, when water was in 2010 declared human right and that uh, provided the background, the legal background also for the fight that was developed last year in, uh, in Europe uh, to have water recognized as human right and managed, owned and managed only publicly. I think that we need to strengthen our capacity to fight at the local level, but at the same time to bring this issue up uh, to the nation, international institution where we can be effective in lobbying and uh, creating uh, some contradiction. The IMF, uh, Madame Lagarde said just uh, Tuesday that, uh, oh, austerity is creating more injustice, but this will be a threat not only to our, the financial stability of our uh, uh, financial institution, that can be a threat to democracy as well, because as soon as the battle divides between the haves and the have-nots, then come the troubles. So I think they start having fear uh, <laughs> about the situation. But the problem is, once she woke up and realized this, 
What is going to do IMF? I think that we must be there and insist in presenting also the contradiction and, you know, the crime that these kind of injustice are producing around the world, as has been said by my colleague before. Uh, finally, uh, the last point, I think uh, we, as global trade union, but in general, as trade union movement, are confronted with uh, I would say a cultural challenge that multinational and the capital is uh, um, is trying to uh, to yeah to pursue uh, against uh, trade unions. Well, I'm normally a, a very moderate person. I'm not a revolutionary. I've never been in my life. So, but I think that we are really at a crucial point. Uh, of the conflict of class uh, in this moment. And uh, what make evident uh, these things, to me at least, is the fact that, that we are often, more and more often, asked uh, by different multinational, by different uh, companies and corporates that organize workers and plant and factories from all over the world, okay, let's get together and start negotiating and find uh, the way to define a global agreement. We do. I mean, I did recently two of these uh, uh, global frame agreement. But what I'm thinking is that there's a kind of idea that we can, let me, I hope you will understand, corporatize the relationship, the real industrial relationship, mm. and focusing on organizing in this company, that's a limit sometimes also of union, or organizing in this company and find a way to get better condition, yeah, no matter what's happening outside, and closing ourselves within the yard of the company. While I think the history and the success of the trade union movement, both when it was successful, uh, at a national level, at a local level, or internationally, is exactly the ambition to represent the general interest of working people, not only within the, the, the working place, but also in looking to outside. Otherwise, we cannot explain the big achievement that workers had. I'm thinking to, you know, the uh, welfare state uh, that was built uh, within the European Union, the recognition uh, of the right to, to health, of the right to education, the right. That's something that you cannot have if you simply look at your workplace. You have to open your mind and find a way to organize and to connect with the environment around you. If we just focus on this idea that making or improving working condition is, is uh, international because it's uh, in 30 or 40 countries will not solve our problem. So I think that what we need is uh, sometimes the courage to uh, be more ambitious, uh, to think that yes, we can solve the problem. I was very happy when I signed the first agreement where occupational health in England days or in uh, Suez, uh, JDF Suez, uh, was recognized and we are implementing uh, mm, training for workers and we are monitoring the situation in different plants. Yes, but is this enough? That doesn't solve the problem of what is outside. I don't know, NL plant in Guatemala where impunity is still there and unionists uh, are still uh, object of violation. I don't have an answer. Rise, fall. Who knows? That will be the history but, uh, to tell us. But I think uh, that what we need, yes, is the need that we need to change. And we need to do it very quickly because the multinational uh, financial system uh, and uh, capital is very well organized, is very well decided to direct globally its strategy. 
while we are still looking at our belly. <laughs> and we need to uh, improve our vision and look uh, forward. Thank you. have a fight on a global level, on the global level within international institutions, multinational corporations. And now we're running out of time, actually we really ran out of time. So uh, what I suggest is that we have uh, one round of uh, questions, comments, and then we break down into groups, because you see the weather is nice outside, and much more people will have opportunity to talk in small groups. So please, uh, if you have questions, comments now, raise your hand. Yes, I see one, I see two, I see three, four. Okay, four, we take four. <laughs> and uh, please name uh, yourself and uh, say to whom you address your comments, questions. So, yes. uh, my name's uh, Brian Simpson from Unite here in the UK. My first question is for Rosa. Um, you talk about organizing out with the workplace, out with the corporation that you are in. How would you propose, as a public services general secretary, that we unite the public sectors and the private sectors? Because for me, that is the key, whether you're in Bangladesh or in Norway, bringing together the public and the private sector workers. That's how we're going to hold the corporations and the government to account. And my second question is to Sanjay. Um, you talked about 1.1 million deaths, and I think that was just last year, wasn't it? Um, I was wondering if you could go into more detail, Sanjeev, about um, the fight back um, against the health and safety and the corruption issues in Asia um, after the, the Rana Plaza collapse. Okay, then we have Lady there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Maria from a French organization in the International Alliance. We are a group of organizers uh, located in different countries. And living in Morocco, we are some Cambodia too. And uh, we support workers uh, of French transnational companies to be organized in the same scale. So we're going from subsidiary to another. So I believe in external organizer for mobilizing and organizing workers, as uh, Sanjay said. But I do have a question to Sanjay. Uh, even if it's difficult, I think I know how to organize precarious workers. Because the, the enemy I and mean, the company that employed them is obvious. But how organizing informal workers? Hi, um, my name is Leon uh, Truman. I'm from the RMT Union here in the UK. Um, Sanji, uh, yeah, following on from the last question, the previous workers. Um, um, we've got zero hours contract workers here, we've got um, agency workers who have less rights. Um, and following up from, from attacks to the right to strike, creative actions, um, creative, creative ways of, of sort of attacking or defending, depending how you want to look at it. What sort of actions can we take? Um, because we, we often think of that, uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a hot topic for progressive trade unions. Um, uh, Rosa, I want to ask you about um, yeah, uh, getting across to the member on the ground. I do that myself, trying to pay them away just on their issues and linking it up to, the, like you said, the general general class issues, working class issues. So could you just speak a little bit more about that? If you, if you could, um, of, um, sort of arguments you can make. I you know, I know some obvious ones, but just from your perspective, and Kirill. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for those three factors. I think that's a really good. Uh, I'll probably use them forever. <laughs> <laughs> I'll credit you. But only if asked. Uh, yeah. I think yeah, it's extremely important. Um, the late we had Bob Crow, who's a uh, recent. He died recently. But one of his uh, biggest focuses and how he was able to grow the union was based on organizing. And it's a word that people still don't really understand. They think it's about putting tables in order. Organizing people with organizations, <laughs> making structures, strategies, stuff like that. 
is very important. So um, I'll, I'll support that. But I will say, um, Occupy, having worked with uh, some of the Occupy people, I wouldn't say they didn't they didn't achieve anything. I think it's a, it's about uh, it's in, it's less tangible what they've achieved, but it's, it's showing that uh, you know where the vulnerabilities are. Um, and they, they've got a different, they've got this sort of horizontal, um, uh, horizontal democracy where they don't like to have leaders and things like that. I don't agree, I don't uh, agree with that, but I do think that what they've achieved is up for the organised lot, us to, to be able to skim off a bit and use it uh, if you know if the energy is there. Um, so maybe if you could talk about maybe strategies for, for, for doing that. <laughs> Um, so Alex, I'm a member of UCU in the UK, and it's re related to what Sandy was saying, but it's probably everybody on the panel can pretty comment on it. Of on kind of the accord and your criticisms of it, I was, thought it was very interesting because it's often held up as being kind of this very great kind of victory and kind of something very, very positive. And it's hard to see kind of with global value chains and the way the clothing system garments garment Industry works at kind of blind auctions and things. How you could, you know, how you could have improvements without some kind of global framework or global agreement. So I was wondering if you could elaborate more on how you envision kind of a better system working, especially with this kind of the guy dichotomy of how you have kind of local trade unionists being involved in that very global kind of agreement. Okay, thank you very much. So now. I will agree answer who's going to be first. Maybe we start from Kino. Yeah. Um, on Occupy, and um, I think the, the, the quite some time already passed since this movement started and had different forms in different countries. Um, I have to say, I did want to provoke. Your reaction, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, of course, as as a grassroots movement, uh, it achieved um, it it achieved quite quite a lot from the point of view of working out new methods and techniques, and as you say, building horizontal links and firing the moderators, because normally the movement. Is supposed to have leadership, which is quite uh, visible, but not always able to respond or represent generally all the interests which are uh, which are involved in the movement. Uh, however, my point is, if we want to achieve, we have said at the same time we we've we've seen this mass mobilization, but at the same time, the pressure from the international capitalism on the working class was increasing. And this movement, even with its achievements, was not able to challenge that system. And uh, from my point of view, that means that we have to look back in history and look at the traditional ways and forms of or organizing, which in the, in the end of 19th century and the beginning of 20th century actually helped to do a lot in terms of sustainable change on the country level and the international level. The experience uh, and national federations in the US, the industrial workers working class demands. And they were really the movements which created the new world. Uh, while with Occupy, we still will have to reflect on. OK. Uh, question about how to organize uh, public and private uh, together if it's not creating contradiction. I think that, uh, no, uh, there will be no contradiction about that. And uh, I uh, am in an organization, I come originally from an organization at national level where we 
have always been organizing uh, workers in the private and in the public sector uh, in uh, waste, water, health, uh, social care uh, services, uh, you know, in all kinds of activities. What makes, in my view, strategic is the vision on the public function of all these kind of services. Because no matter where they are managed, even though some services must be preferable uh, managed publicly, they are for the most part publicly funded, or at least there's a lot of public money invested in these services, even when they are privatized. And this, for instance, doesn't prevent me as a trade union leader or as an organization that organizes public services to, at the same time, having a global frame agreement with Enel to respect, for instance, the workers' rights uh, all over the world, but at the same time supporting the FLN in Guatemala, fighting against the privatization of the energy sector in Guatemala. Uh, that's not a contradiction, because now what I have is the picture of workers that are already working in private companies that I have to protect with the tool that I have, uh, uh, the tools that I have as a trade unionist. But the policy, when I look at the, the situation around and I look at the policy, I only, I always think, uh, I only think that, for instance, we have the need to, to launch. And I know you are going to to speak uh, next uh, in the week uh, about that. Uh, uh, that we need to launch a stronger uh, campaign for public energy as we are doing on water because these are fundamental natural resources that we need for our life. Uh, I don't think that uh, will be a contradiction. I also believe another thing, that uh, uh, preserving a fundamental role of public services, uh, meaning owned and managed publicly is an element of regulation of the market. Wherever you have strong public service uh, organized, there cannot be strong corruption, strong penetration, or uh, social dumping by private companies. That's an element, and that's an element that can provide a balance. I don't think we will be able in the next future, maybe not even in the far future, <laughs> uh, uh, to have all publicly managed, but asking to invest in public services and asking uh, to the public to play this role of regulator is fundamental. And playing this role not only through rules, but also through the uh, delivery direct delivery of services, that is an element to compare with for all private that are asked to, you know, participate in this, uh, in the delivery of these uh, services. Um, how we can, uh, I mean, um, better develop our strategy to represent the general interest or uh, uh, of the working class, but I would say the general interest of citizens, of people. Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, uh, we need uh, different uh, to use different argument. First, I I, I think that uh, what is important is uh, to be aware uh, that when we play our role as workers. Uh, we don't just fight or strive to get uh, uh, some benefit for a small group, uh, but uh, every piece of uh, you know improvement or each uh, conquest that uh, we or achievement that we can get is just a, a small brick that we can bring to a bigger construction for the defense of workers' rights uh, in, in general. Um, I also think that sometime we must be able to uh, 
Yes, also to decide what is important or uh, for the general interest or not. Just to give you an example, maybe two. Uh, um, the municipality of Paris decided uh, some year, few years ago to remunicipalize the management of water that was uh, in the hand of uh, Suez and Veolia, two big multinational. The mayor a very highlighted man, he said, no, it's time to stop with this multinational that work for profit and retake in our hand the management of water. Uh, it was a success, the operation. In two years they were able to reduce 30% the tariffs, the water tariff, and uh, to uh, increase at the same time the investment uh, in the sector. But all this happened against all the trade unions that were organizing the workers in the two companies. Uh, they were against. They were against because they were enjoying uh, better uh, uh, wages under the private uh, than uh, what they expected uh, to, to have under the public. But this doesn't, uh, uh, didn't prevent uh, PSI to support the mayor of Paris because the interest was much broader than the single interest of workers. And of course, what we uh, suggested and we tried to do was exactly to help uh, the union in France to have, uh, to reach an agreement with the municipality in order to protect the right of the workers that were going from the private company to the public, uh, to the public, because the interest in that case was not only the working condition, was the general interest of some million people in living in Paris that had the right to have public water rather than. The same can be the discussion that is very sensitive. I know, for instance, on nuclear, we have as PSI, I think we are the only union uh, globally that have a, a clear mandate to uh, look to policies to overcome uh, the nuclear uh, production uh, of energy. That was a resolution uh, presented by our Japanese affiliate and uh, approved by uh, PSI Congress recently. That doesn't mean that we simply ask, shut down the plants and get rid of all the workers there. I think that what is interesting, very much interesting to see is what is happening in Germany right now, how they organize the transition, how they prepare to this change of pace and change of phase that will be very important. So this means representing the general interest, uh, in my view, not only uh, the specific one. Uh, well, I think that's all. <laughs> oh, just quickly because I think we need to break for the groups. Uh, uh, my friend asked me what is the fight back on health and safety. I, I think uh, uh, the problem is these, even though there are 1.1 million workers who die every year in Asia, but if you see official data, it doesn't reflect. They're still invisible uh, deaths. Uh, but there is a there is a victims organizing happening. It's very similar what happened in the West. You know, the yeah, industrialization yeah. always has been followed by the deaths and injuries to the workers. Uh, the only way these people can get any justice is when they organize themselves. So there is a at a large scale organizing of victims. And in case of Bangladesh, also the Rana Plaza uh, and Tazreen Fire, they have formed a victims group and that is in relation to the question which you asked is how can things change uh, in terms of accord and alliance. I mean the important thing is in Bangladesh workers are not dying only in the government industry. Workers are dying, majority of workers are dying of silicosis which we call a disease of disposition. As soon as you are released from the land the first job you will get is breaking the stones and that's where the silica dust gets into your lungs. 
and millions of workers in Asia, also in Latin America, are exposed to the silica dust. How do we change their situation? You know, it's uh, we are only sometimes focused on export oriented. Something I wear here in the West or even in Hong Kong, I feel this should be manufactured ethically. But structurally, why people are getting sick? And the things will change the way they changed here in US, UK, or anywhere else in the past when workers together fought for better laws, for better inspections, and for things to be implemented here, not from outside. So there has to be a process of strengthening of the local democratic institutions that includes factory inspectorates, local trade unions. See, that is a very important thing. It's a painstakingly longer process. But I don't think there can be shortcuts. I think local empowerment, people have to take struggle in their own hands. Uh, Sanjeev, may I interrupt? I've really got to take Rosa away. <laughs> yes, I, I'm, I'm really sorry. I have to leave, unfortunately. I have to go to, to Los Angeles. And so it's unfair. I'm not used to do this, but uh, that was the only opportunity. I just, sorry to interrupt you and give me just one minute. I just want to, to add one thing uh, to what I said. In order to uh, represent the general interest, I think one, one thing is fundamental, and this is also the answer to the problem that, uh, uh, that Kirill raised. Building coalition is strategic. We cannot win if we are organized only as workers. We can win if we are able to organize with civil society and social movement and uh, a democratic organization that can represent different aspects of our, uh, you know, uh, polyedric uh, communities now. Uh, this is fundamental, this is strategic, and if we are unable as trade union to do this, we can have small success, but we will not be able to win uh, the war, that I almost sure. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> So for organizing in informal sector, I think there is a session on how to organize. And there are a lot of groups here who are uh, organizing in the informal sector. They can share their experiences. And last question was about how the precarious workers can take action, which my brother here in UK asked. I think right, I mean, we were talking about right to strike. I mean, what I showed you about the strikes in Asia, None of the countries has right to strike, but people go on strike. So the most of the victories in Asia in terms of minimum wage were fought on street in Cambodia, in Bangladesh, in Indonesia. So we need to get on the street at some point of time. We have nothing to lose now. I mean, that's all I can say. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>